Hello and welcome to the course. I'm your host today, Lee, and I'm speaking with Assistant Professor Alisa Kadizel from the Department of Statistics and the College. Her research focuses on the interplay between probabilistic and algebraic properties of lattice models in statistical mechanics. Professor Kadizel is here to talk to us about her career path and how she became a University of Chicago professor. Welcome to the course, Professor Elisa Kniesel. It is a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me. So Elisa, can you give me a general sense of your career path from your college years all the way to becoming a professor at the University of Chicago? I grew up in St. Petersburg, Russia, and that's where I went to college. So I studied math and statistics at St. Petersburg State University. Like this used to be a five-year program, which is equivalent to, to, once you finish it, it's equivalent to the master's degree in the U.S. For the first four years, I took a bunch of classes in math and physics. And then like the fifth year is for writing a thesis. Yeah, so... After that, I applied for PhD programs in the U.S. and I got them admitted to a couple of places and went to MIT, where I did my PhD under the supervision of Professor Alexei Borodin, focusing on the field uh, which is called integrable probability. After that, I was an NSF postdoctoral fellow at Columbia University for three years. Right after I came to U Chicago in 2020, where I started my tenure track. Perfect. And can you explain what you do and what your research is about to someone who, you know, maybe doesn't understand statistics or has the level of mathematical expertise that you have? I'm a probabilist and uh, the type of questions that I am interested in uh, my work, they usually arise from physics and more precisely from statistical physics. So usually uh, those are the questions about the systems of particles of large size that with each other. And we study a model which is much, much simplified compared to what's going on in the real world, but still it captures important features. And by analyzing those models, we also can make predictions about the like, process which uh, occur like, uh, in nature. So like one of the example of uh, the, the simple process that I recently worked on, and which is quite related to what we saw yesterday, uh, is the process of, accumulate, uh, of the accumulation of the snowflakes of your, on, on your windshield when you're driving. So uh, you have an interface of uh, snowflakes growing on your windshield. And um, the question that you can ask is about uh, the, like, uh, how uh, the design and the appearance of this interface and uh, yeah, so there's like a uh, like one of the type of questions that I came up, one of the type of, the, of applications that you can name in the real world, which recently came up uh, in my work. But uh, that's like a very um, common uh, a common feature, not only for this type of growth process, but for many others. And more interestingly, uh, they occur in uh, something uh, like the growth of a cancer tumor. So there are like much more about uh, the process, which look quite similar to this uh, innocence process of the um, accumulation of the snow snowflakes on your windshield. Thank you for that explanation. Elisa, can you tell me a little bit about what you were like when you were younger and growing up in Russia? What did you think you were going to be when you grew up? Yes, so my family was not in academia in, in any sense. So, like, first I realized that I'm interested in math uh, when I started participating in different competitions during, uh, during middle school. So it's very common for, for, for middle school students in Russia to go to different competitions in math, in literature, in, like, in other fields. And it just happened that, like, somehow I, I performed... Um, reasonably well in one of the competitions. And I remember very well myself, the, like how all the students who participated well in that competition, they, they were invited to the, to the university. And there was like a large classroom 
with a lot of kids and uh, there was a presentation by professors who were awarding the best students that year. And uh, I remember uh, my fascinate, like how fascinated I was about the speeches that uh, those professors gave about their work and uh, about math in general. And uh, yeah, and that's how I like first realized that I am very much interested in this community, first of all, the community of mathematicians. And then like later I started going to a different uh, math clubs and also math uh, summer camps, which I enjoyed a lot. And uh, I um, uh, started like slowly becoming more successful in math and particularly in those math, math competitions, I performed better and better. And that's uh, what was going on up until high school years. Uh, in high school, uh, I still was very much focused on math, but I also like had a couple of other thoughts in my head about what I might be considering during later in life. In particular, I was always very much interested in, in art history and art in general. So my biggest hobby is painting. So I was, yeah, so I was thinking that might be also an interesting career, yeah, like going into art history and continue painting. So yeah, so that was like my two choices uh, back in high school, but uh, yeah, but math uh, clearly prevailed and uh, yeah, I, uh, and painting uh, has become my, my biggest hobby since then. That's fascinating that you have these dual interests in art and math. Do you see them related? In any way? Yes, for me, math uh, is a form of art, first of all. And uh, yeah, like second, it's the community of people who share a lot of similar values in uh, many respects. So yeah, so I uh, see uh, like those two very much uh, related. And I know you applied for PhD programs in the U.S. So that meant that you had to leave your home country and move to the U.S. for school. And I know that PhD programs are difficult, challenging programs for people that are, you know, born in the U.S. What was it like for you to navigate that challenge and do it in a different country? It was pretty hard for me uh, at the beginning. I, I, I underestimated uh, uh, before coming how hard it would be on the personal level because I, very, I was very homesick and I didn't have like any friends. It was was the first the time I I was so far away from my family and I didn't know anybody in in Boston before coming. Yeah, so it took me um, some time to get adjusted, to meet people, and to gain friends. And like once uh, the personal side was settled, I also felt much more confident about um, uh, about my academic life, about the classes that I was taking and conducting the research as well. So during that period, who were the people that you leaned on for support? It was still my uh, my family. And also after uh, the first year, I um, already was, was settled on my choice for the advisor. So my advisor helped me a lot with the advice about the academic life and also suggesting different projects that, that, that I uh, can work on and that helped me uh, tremendously. Yeah. And yeah. And also like after the first year, I, I, I met my friends and uh, yeah, so that uh, was a huge, that's, that was a, a huge support that they provided me yeah, since then. And, and Elisa, you know, with the expertise that you have in mathematics, I imagine that there are other career opportunities that you could have pursued. Why did you want to be a professor? Well, like, first of all, it's uh, the freedom that uh, uh, you have as a professor to choose what research projects you want to work on. You don't necessarily have this uh, freedom anywhere else. So, like, I can say more. I don't really know anybody uh, uh, working in the industry who has the same level of freedom or of choice, what they want to work on. And second is the community. I very much uh, like the um, the academic community. I like my colleagues and also students. Uh, I uh, I feel constantly inspired by them and also motivated to to evolve and produce better work. And when did you realize that 
probability? And how did you realize that probability was something that you wanted to focus on? For my master thesis, I was uh, actually working on a different field, which was algebraic topology. And uh, in general, I uh, consider all parts of, of mathematics equally beautiful and important. But for my research, I decided to choose a field which uh, I felt that uh, simultaneously is like well suited for my own personal skills uh, that I can successfully apply in my research in that field. And second, uh, it's also the field uh, which kind of like brings together a lot of a lot of connections. So the interval probability that I work on, it ha- well, in, in my research, uh, I always encounter techniques and questions that come from all uh, over the place. Uh, in particular, the written project that I had was on uh, on the study of a certain stochastic uh, partial differential equation, but uh, it required me to learn a uh, quite a bit of analytic number theory, which is quite exceptional, I think. So yeah, so that brings me a lot of joy to be able to also constantly uh, learn new things about other areas of math in my research. And then Elisa, tell me about what goals you have for yourself and your professional career. I have a certain research program with the number of problems that I'm very deeply interested in, and I really want to make progress on those. And uh, I also want to build uh, a research group around me, consisting of uh, students and uh, postdocs uh, that will bring the best from all of us, so that uh, we would be working on the problems that we are interested in and helping each other to, and like pushing each other to, uh, to do better and to discover more. That's um, the two biggest goals for me. And also I view uh, the service and mentorship as a very important part of my work. I'm very grateful for uh, uh, to all the mentors that uh, I met throughout my academic path. And I want to uh, give back the same to my students. And uh, therefore, I uh, try to devote uh, quite a bit of my time on mentoring and advising students, organizing conferences and other events that promote uh, mathematics and especially uh, like support of younger students and uh, scientists. And what would you say is the most fun part of your work? Well, the math itself is, is the most fun part of my work. And yeah, and the, the moment uh, once, uh, yeah, like the first moment uh, when you realize this aha moment, when you realize that uh, you found the right clue there and uh, you have now the key to solve the problem. And the second, once you share it with others, you share your joy about this with others with your colleagues and students. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's a lot of fun and uh, that brings me a lot of joy. And what would you say is the least fun or the most challenging aspect of your job? The most challenging aspect of my job? Well, there are a lot of routine things that uh, you you still have to do. Like, like, for example, like once you figure everything out, you still need to put it on the, on the paper and write comprehensive article about it. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, but I wouldn't say that it's particularly stressful or challenging. It's just uh, not as fun. Yeah, so cannot really name like the like something which uh, I find uh, like really stressful or challenging uh, well, in, in a bad way. Yeah, like, you know, well, conducting research is challenging, but it's uh, not a bad thing to have. It's actually a fun uh, that it's challenging. It wasn't, uh, yeah, it wouldn't have been fun if it was not challenging. So, yeah, the things that are least enjoyable are some of those tedious things that you have to do. So if you talk about the tedious things to do, the uh, the administrative stuff, like around uh, especially large classes, would be just a lot, you know, like handling uh, all the uh, special cases when the students, uh, you know, cannot come to the exam or for one reason or another and all these things. So that's, yeah, that's uh, not uh, like very fun and uh, can sometimes be just a lot in terms of the volume. Yeah, so that's, yeah, those are probably uh, the least uh, enjoyable things that uh, I have in my work. 
yeah, administrative stuff around uh, large classes. And Elisa, what would be your advice for people who are considering entering your field? So people who are considering pursuing a PhD and a career as a professor in mathematics. In my opinion, the most uh, important part for the academic career is the natural drive and enjoyment of the research. And uh, it's important to remember about it because like uh, uh, there are a lot of difficult moments during the PhD life and later on, especially um, sociologically difficult moments when you are stuck on the problem, when uh, you're not sure about uh, your max job and like many others. But I think the, uh, like, as, as long as you keep within yourself the uh, loss and enjoyment of the field that, that you're working on, then uh, you can overcome all these obstacles. I think it's, yeah, it's very important to nurture this uh, in your heart. Do you have any advice specifically for people who are coming to the U.S. to pursue this kind of career and they grew up in a different country? The biggest advice is to be kind to yourself and, uh, and try not to put even more pressure than you already have. And try to be more more forgiving because it's indeed uh, not an easy transition, and it definitely uh, takes uh, time to adjust to a new place, new culture, and uh, new people. And then finally, Elisa, what do you find most fulfilling about the work that you do? I very much love what I'm doing. And uh, yeah, this question is a bit hard for me because there are very few things which I don't really find fulfilling in my work. So I very much enjoy doing research. I very much enjoy working with the students and I very much uh, enjoy the interactions with my colleagues. So like there are some parts which are hard in navigating the academic line, but all, uh, but I do truly enjoy all the main things and I really find them very fulfilling. Thank you, Professor Elisa Kniesel, for your time today. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow, and share this episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Stay tuned for more, and thanks for listening.